it's it's a, it's a shame that we're sitting here now in the 21st century talking about a Black History Month. You know, if, if we have to have a Black History Month every year to show people, you know, about equality and about diversity and about education, you know, then we, we are still a long, long way to go. You know, we, we've been, Black people have done a, a, a lot for this country and a lot for the world and not being recognised because we've always kind of felt that we are the minority, okay? Uh, and, and that's something that we're still trying to kind of climb over obstacles about, you know, we've, we feel that way. And, and I think by doing it, yes, it gives us recognition for what we've achieved. And um, it was funny you mentioned that because last night I was watching a film um, called Respect. Um, it's about Aretha Franklin. And it was about her biography about, and Jennifer Hudson was playing it. And it showed, you know, all the kind of history with Martin Luther King and, how she was an activist for, for black rights movements and all that. And, 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 it, and it was amazing, amazing to see what these people have gone through back in the days, just so the people, like people like me, you know, can, can sit here and talk to you and sit, or have a life and play football, enjoy my life. These people have gone through so much, uh, going back to Martin Luther King and Jesse Jackson, or you can go back as far as you want. Um, and I, I feel we've still got a long way to go. I feel that, you know, we talk about racism and racism is, is for me, is, is not just about black people. You know, racism it can be in all kinds of forms or religions or creeds or colors. It can be anything, you know, um, but it's about education. It's, it's about learning, you know, the young kids now, you know, and that's, and that's what I like about the schools now and the youth zones because there's all different colors and creeds and diversities and, and, and they, don't, they don't look at color. I just look at you as a person um, and I've been in football and I've, you know, where people look at you as a colour, you know, and, and that's always been a problem. When we still this problem now, we talk about black managers, you know, there's probably one or two in the, in, in the football league. That's, that's embarrassing. You know, we're now we're at the moment where we've got 25% of black players now playing in the football league. Five years ago, there was probably 12%, you know, so we're getting in that degree. But I think where we are in society is about education and teaching a younger generation about racism, you know, about seeing someone for who they are, not for what colour their skin is. Uh, and I think the more we keep pushing it out there, you know, not just every, not just once, once a month, you know, I think we need to push it out even more. You know, I mean, the players in, in the Premier League are making, they're using their platforms, the likes of Rashford and Sterling, you know, we're, we're kneeling before games, you know, it's a show of, against discrimination. But more needs to be done. And I just think sometimes we have a Black History Month and it's great for four weeks and then we go on to something else. I want a continuation of this every month, every month, every month until we start to try to eradicate. You're never going to eradicate racism solely. You know, it's a, it's a social, it's a cultural thing. But you can learn and you can, you can filter it down and water it down. And, and the only way we're going to do that if we keep pushing that button and saying we're not prepared to put up with this discrimination, we're not prepared to put up with this, you know, and they call a situation where people get jobs because they're white and not because they're black. And, you know, that, that can't be right. You know, we, you know, it's a world of equal, equal, um, equal, what's the word I'm talking about? Equal, um, equal qualities, basically. We talk about football now. You know, we now got women involved in that men's football. We've got women commentating on men's football. Wouldn't have even perceived that would have happened four or five years ago. You know, so we are trying to change. You know, everyone was trying to change, uh, but we've still got a long, long way to go. They don't really kind of see that kind of side of it because I'm black and my wife's white. They don't see it as an issue. They just, you know, but I think my daughter, Ria, I think she kind of appreciates it more than, than my two boys. You know, I think boys are kind of kind of flippant with it and they think, okay, back history month. But <clears throat> Ria's more into it, you know, and like what it means. And, you know, I just, say, I just say, listen, darling, you know, as much as you're here now, it's important to remember the people in Black History Month, you know, who got you where you are today. And, you know, and go back and look at, you know, the 60s, you know, the 50s, when, 
all the anarchy was going on and the apartheid and you know black people get beat and killed and hung and all that type of stuff you know look back in history you know and, and, and have a realization how fortunate we are to be born in this time to be present at this time um and that's all you can say you know i, I, don't, I don't try to make it too deep but i have more better conversations about this than with my daughter than i do with my two sons to be fair <laughs> but listen that they realize that i mean you can't get away from it you know as i said the good thing about TV, radio, it's on there. It's in your face every time, you know, for the last month. Adverts, it's on your face all the time. Adverts now, I've seen more adverts with black people than I've seen in my whole life. Um, because it's important, it's important. Um, so we can't get away from it. We just got to keep pushing forward with it. Oh, well, I'll I tell you a story. I, I, went, I, played, I made my debut for West Ham. Um, away and um we were getting beat 4-0 and then John Lowell said pull warm up it was about 20 minutes to go so I warmed up down the side outside of the fans the opposing fans and all of a sudden you know the monkey chants the bananas come on the pitch the coins and I'm you know and I'm think I'm like wow I, I couldn't I couldn't believe it but the only thing that could still be in good stead for that because I'd spent six, seven years prior to that standing on Bennett's, course, Bennett's Castle Lane, you know, where I've had cars come past, white lads come past in cars and cause us, cause us the discrimination names and, you know, that type of stuff. So it was like I was hardened to that, even though it's my first game. I, I didn't expect it to be actually on the terraces. I think that was more of a culture shock for me. But I think I was mentally tough enough, even at 18, with what I'd kind of been through in life, um, that I was mentally tough enough to say, it doesn't matter, you know, whatever they throw at me, you know, my, my aim and has, hasn't changed. And, um, you know, even after that game and then, you know, going back into the change room, you know, and talking to people like Bobby Barnes and, and, I, was, and I was like, is this how it is? He said, yeah, Paul, this is part of our culture. This is a cultural thing. You know, it's, it's okay, it seems okay to say racial stuff, you know, against black players, that it's the way it is, you know, unfortunately you have to deal with it. If you don't, it's sink or swim, you know, and, and it's one of them. If you're not mentally tough enough to deal with it, then, then, then you're going to sink, you know, and, and that's something that I had a conversation with Sil Regis about, Brendan Batson, you know, what was it like in their times and those, and it was, it was, it was 10 times as worse. You know, so it, by them saying that, I felt I kind of got it easy, to be fair. And, and this is the thing, because we talk about the players now, you know, with Instagram and social media. I mean, it's never, it should, it's never, it should, ne it should never have to write on social media something about a black player because he's made a mistake or done something wrong. Um, but in a, in, a, in a kind of perverse kind of way, they're kind of fortunate in the fact that it wasn't back in the 70s, back in the 80s, where they were throwing bananas at you and calling you this and calling you that, you know. Um, so we're, we're, we're like forebearers for what they're doing now. Um, but no, I, 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 I realised this that was how it was in football in the 80s. I realised that nothing was going to stand in my way. Um, and, I realized, and I just kind of mentally just dealt with it. And I always kind of felt if they was shouting stuff at me, it means they were trying to put me off. And the reason why they were trying to put me off was because I was a good player. Uh, and, and that's what it was. And, and to be fair, that, that was their excuse. That was, that, was, that was the excuse to say, well, the reason why they shout racial abuse at you was to try and put you off your game. And I think, what type of excuse is that? You know, what type of excuse is that? If that's how it was, then I could deal with it. But it's not a reason, you know, to shout abuse at someone to put them off their game. Um, but as, as it got on into the 80s, you know, you, got, you kind of get accustomed to it, you kind of get used to it, you know, and even, even going back to 1995 when I went to Inter Milan, over there there was just this racist, it was no, no different. And, and it was like, it's okay to be racist, it's part of our game. This is what the fans do, you know, the governing bodies are not prepared to do anything because it's part of our culture. And this is something we're trying to do now, is change our culture. No, you can listen, you can sit in hindsight and say yes, but, you know, I, I kind of felt the more black players were, we were getting into the game, um, because, and I'll just quickly rewind a bit, because when I went into Milan, 
and um, the races was rife. And there wasn't a lot of black players playing in Serie A at the moment. There was me, George Weir, a few others. Um, and we all kind of had a meeting and we was talking about, you know, there seem to be more black players now coming into the Italian Football League. And we can't put up with this racism stuff all the time. They think it's okay to do this and we're not going to put up with it. You know, so we met someone from the Italian um, FA and said, listen, this needs to stop. You know, there's a lot of French guy and players coming in here, a lot of black players, and you need to do something about it. Never did anything about it, which didn't surprise me. It didn't surprise me. Um, but then going back to West Ham, I, I, I kind of felt at the time, at the moment, you just accept this is it. You know, this is it. You know, I, th I think it'd have been hard for someone who had probably a, a decent, a decent upbringing, where didn't have to kind of experience all these um, racial chants standing on the street corner, then to go onto a pitch, not having experience what I experienced, and then having that, that thrown at him or her. I, 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 that that would be. I'm not sure you could deal with that, but for me, I was hardened to it because I, I, I've been brought up on on, on that type of stuff. Um, did I think it would change at the time? No. As the years went on, then it looked like it was starting to change. Once once tough people started to wake up, you know, a lot of people have their eyes shut to this type of stuff and pretend they're asleep, you know. And we have to wake these people up. And uh, I think even now. You know, there's still a lot of people with their eyes shut, you know, making out their sleep. And um, we have to keep waking these people up. And we're doing that. You know, everyone's doing it. The press are trying to do it. The papers, the TV, the PFA, LMA, Premier League, the footballers now have a massive platform. And it can't be just the black footballers. You know, because I think when we talk about Black History Month, just what Lizzie was saying prior to that, everyone talks about black... Black people talk about black people. You know, there's no there's no... You don't see many white people and they're talking about black people and we need to stop it and to do this. It's always black people saying their point. You know, we've seen it with the basketball players. You know, it's all black people talking about black people. We I need to see more white people talking about racism and how we need to stop it, how it's not leaders, characters, people who are role models to people. You know, I need to see more of that. Um, but we're all trying to make an effort uh, to try and stamp stamp this out. We can only do a certain thing, we can't change social, the way social and cultural environment of people think about black people or whoever they may be. As footballers, we have a platform where we can make a difference. And um, that's the most important thing that we, we, we keep pursuing that and keep doing that. And the likes of myself and Rashford and Sterling, all the ones who are role, model, role models to a lot of kids, not just black kids, but white kids too. You know, got to keep putting it out. And as I said to Lizzie, we've got to keep putting it out. And we are getting better. You know, we, two, three years ago, you know, racism on the terrorists was was more or less gone. Now, so the next two, three years, it starts to wear an ugly, ugly head again. And that says to me, we're, we're now, we're, we've got a long way to go. I've, I just thought, great. You know, I'm going to be England captain. What an honour. Unbelievable. Who would have thought? You know, and, and it, it made me think back to my journey, where it all started, you know, on Beckenshaw Avenue or Parslow's Park, or it, it, it did, because I thought, wow, I've come such a long way, you know, I've gone from like standing on the street corner, fighting, kicking and drinking and doing all that stuff, you know, to now, you know, playing for the biggest clubs in the world, England captain, never went to school, but then I now can speak another language. And all these things just kind of come flowing back Black to you. So the journey that I've made to get where I am, you know, for me as a for me personally, it, it, it's, um, it, it's, it's fantastic. So when I just kind of went in, into the press conference and they said, "Oh, Paul, what's it like to be the first black Indian captain?" I, didn't, I never looked at it that way. I just looked at it as what's it like just to be the captain of England? Why does the colour have to come into it? You know, if Alan Shearer was the same, they wouldn't say Alan Shearer. What's it like to be the first white England captain? Would they? So they saw colour, and I said, "Well." To be fair, I, I don't see it as that. I was proud that I was a black England captain, don't get me wrong, but it was just the fact I was England captain. Um, so that was kind of strange feeling for me. And, and I never realized how much um, it inspired other people. And it was only after the, um, the uh, Italy run game. Um, and I got back home and I must have had about, seriously, about 2000 letters 
Baldur's Gate. Big bags, all right? And, 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 I, and I, I read all of them. And, and, and probably 60% of them were non, from non-related people, from parents, from doctors, from MPs, from just normal mothers, single parent fathers, all that type of stuff. Just saying, you know, how you've inspired our children, how you inspired me, you know, how, how we, you know, have read your journey, seen your journey, read your story, you know, and I've read it to my children, you know, or my child, or just letters like that. And, and that's, for me, was the, something I never realised, but I, I, I'd inspired other people so much. You don't realise that. And, you know, you kind of think, if I can inspire people, that's all I want out of life, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm, it's not about myself. And to know that I've inspired, I'm talking around the world, I'm talking Nigeria, I'm talking Kenya, I'm talking China, I'm t you name a country, I had letters from these people saying what an inspiration I was. And, you know, that, that's the thing when people say to me, you know, when, when, when I finish my career, what's the highlight? And they said, the highlight for me is that I've inspired so many people to try and feel that, you know, you can get out of where you want to get to and you can, and it takes a lot of hard work and a lot of sacrifice. But if you've got the desire, you know, you, you can do it. And here's the reason why, and this is the story where I am now, that you can do that. And that was the greatest thing for me that came out of that, you know, not, not just being captain of England, but the effect it had on so many kids. We've now got 25%, maybe 30% now black people playing in the football league. Um, and when they, when, they, when they finish their careers, we need, to, we need to make sure there's an avenue for them to go right, because the football's a short career. You know, it's 15 years, 16 years max. You know, so we need to make sure that when the young black players or people come to the end of their career, feel like they've got an avenue to go into coaching, to go into management. You know, and, and I, but I don't want it to be a token gesture because they're black. We're going to give you an avenue because you're black. No, I also state that if you want to be a manager or a coach, you have to do your qualifications. You have to do your badges. You know, like I had to do. Because if you haven't, they'll always use it against you. They'll always have, I don't, I don't want none of these people, none of these chairmen or CEOs or whoever it may be to have an excuse not to employ a black person because he's black. Some, some excuses will be because he's black, but sometimes they use the excuse that he hasn't got the qualifications when the real excuse is because he's black. So it's one of those, it, it, I, I, I managed for seven years and I managed in every league, Premier League, every league. And, but I had to put up stones. I had to do miracle jobs to get a job in the Premier League at Blackburn. You know, you write what you say, Greg, when things go wrong, they're so quickly to fire you. You know, but we do, we, we see that all the time. And it's like, it's not, it's not so that it's like, it feels like every time a black manager does wrong, the rest of the people, the football, football fraternity think, oh, well, black managers are no good. There's a stigma that if someone has a bad time, oh, black managers are no good, whether it's me, whether it's Chrissy Hutton or Chris Powell. I mean, someone like John Barnes, he, 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 he's got a vast knowledge of football. You know, he went to Celtic with Kenny Dalglish. You know, he comes back, can't get a job. And he, he knows more about football than most other people. I just think it's, it's, it's an education where, you know, you talk about the AFL, you have to have to interview a black manager every time a job comes up. There's only certain clubs who are doing that. It's not every club, you know. And the thing is, even then, are they doing that? I don't think they do. Because what we need to get to is a situation where... What clubs are doing now it's okay we'll interview Paul Ince because that's what the criteria says but we've already got our man anyway because we spoke to him before the manager got sacked <laughs> so but we're just trying to tick a box here you know and, and that's something it needs to change we talked about you know the Rooney rule the Rooney rule two years ago it came up and you know what they do in in, in America and the NFL and the NBA that's the model we need to look at we spoke about it for a week the Rooney rule I haven't spoke about it since then now, the NFL and the NBA state that you have to have a black coach or black manager in your side, in your, in your staff. That's how it works. And we see so many black NBA managers and same in NFL because they've got the more the right and because people now believe they've got a chance to go into that next line of work. My son's 30 years of age and he plays at Stoke. 
And I'm thinking, I'm thinking to myself, in four or five years' time, I'm hoping things will change where you can go into a coaching role and you can go into a manager's role and people are not going to judge you on your colour because when you are black and you're in a manager's role, you get less time than if you was white in a manager's role. And, and that can't be right. Maybe because they feel we're in a minority. Maybe, as I said to Lizzie, it's education. It's understanding that, you know, doesn't matter what colour skin you are, you're there to do a job. And, 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 and if you can do that job, you should give them that job. But don't not give them that job because they're the wrong colour. That, 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 that's the current work right. So we're still learning on that. But ultimately, Greg, the owner's the owner. He, he decides what manager he wants. As much as we try to say, well, listen, we keep opening the door, we keep pushing the door forward, and, you know, we want black players and black people to get chances and black women to get chances in management. Ultimately, it's the owner who make that decision. You know, and I think the less black managers and black we, we see in the game and black coaches, the more the footballers who will be finishing in their career will go on to do something else. And then we'll be, then we'll be losing more, maybe, maybe, top managers out of the game. I, I think we've got a long, long way to go to. I think something has to change drastically. I'm not saying I'm not saying put people into roles because they're black. It's down to the black people to make sure that they're ready to do it and they're prepared to do it. But all, all we're asking is for a chance and an opportunity to show what we can do. Some black managers can't even get to the into the interview room where they can sit down and talk and put their points across. You know, that has to, that, that's to, that should go across all the board. Because eventually, if you do that, then you will get a job and you will be successful. And then that starts the, the domino effect with the people who are coming out of the game. It's going, be, it's, going be, it's going to be a long way into a black manager comes in and wins maybe the, the Premier League or an English black manager. But as we, as we sit here now, well, there's probably only six or seven of us. You know, and I, and I don't see anybody else coming from behind. You know, and why would these footballers now who get paid vast amount of money, you know, when they finish their career, why would they think, well, let me go into management, but well, I'm not going to get a chance, I'm not going to get the time, I don't need to do it. You know, you see the stress that it brings on people. And, and, and I don't feel comfortable about doing it, I'd rather go and do something else. And that's why you see a lot of players go into punditry, you know, that type of stuff. Um, so unless we get to the stage where these ex-players or players who come to the career and behind them feel that there's an avenue that they're going to get a chance and they're going to show what they can do, then, then we, we, we're going to be stagnating for a long, long time.